tough times. He is Lord. Amen. Amen. We declare your goodness, Lord.
shout for joy. Praise the Lord. Worthy is his name. The water you turned into wine You opened the eyes of the blind There's no one like you Not like you Into the darkness you shine
God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. And our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater. And our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than give us words from the Holy Spirit. He will reveal things to us. And one thing he was revealing to me was the things that we think are small, he looks at them as they are very big. The cold drink of water that you give someone that's thirsty, you think that that's nothing. But kindness is one of the things that God loves. He loves kindness. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, gentleness, meekness goodness, faithfulness, love, joy, peace, through the Spirit. And God chooses to include kindness, delivering a meal to someone who needs it, a little pocket change for someone who's out of money, giving in the offering and not knowing where it's going, but knowing that God is in control and that he it ends up going to someone's home who has nothing, absolutely nothing, or they can't even pay their bill. God loves kindness. So the word, the revelation that he's given me to share with you is, do not think that the small things you do are nothing because they are great. God says, that's my daughter and that's my son doing that. And it delights his heart with great delight do things for him and you do it with with a heart that's truly and wonderfully filled with his love Hallelujah. 
That's your prayer this, this morning. God wants to do that. He wants you to stay in the process. And it's not an easy process to stay in the crushing. And the pressing is hard. But he will take the old flames and give you new fire. If you stay in the process, and don't give up. Stay the course. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Come on, Brother Ben. 
Yes. Well, good morning, Grace Community. Uh, this is my second time ever since I've been in this church doing this. So I'm trying to fill up for our pastor, Ken White. Big shoes to fill. Tell you what, he's a great, godly man. Anyways, good morning to everyone. Uh, here we are gathered together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Our announcement for this week will be like the Compassion Sunday. I, uh, I come from a communist country, and most of you people have heard my testimony. We sometimes went without food. My wife can testify that every time that we go to a restaurant, I take left leftovers home. It's just because of the fact I appreciate food. So these children, they actually need our help. We appreciate our donations and our help just for us to give them some so they can have some money to some support. Remember, we had to help this, those less fortunate ones. Then, after that, then we have a special events on Sundays. And April 30th will be a baptism. Somebody's going to get baptized. Who's the one? Two people's going to get baptized here. Three. Oh, we got three. Well, the numbers keep going up. How about four now? Can I get a four, please? A four. Okay. <laughs> All right. We have four people getting baptized, and we have one baby. Yeah, hopefully we have a bunch of babies. Okay, so bring all your babies in, so we're going to pray for them, and they can. All right, now the next thing will be, the fire starters is on first of every Monday. It's the first Monday, I'm sorry, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., led by Pastor Ben and Pastor Roseville. Share ideas, pray your needs, sing praises, hear short teachings, and ask questions. That's a good time for us to get together and fellowship. Okay. The next frame will be on um, Wednesday. We got together. We have a, what Pastor Ken say, a family meal. That's a, one of the favorite times, uh, you know, he likes to eat. And who doesn't like to eat? We all like to eat anyways, okay? There will be a family meal, and then from 6 to 7, We'll be like gathering together, fellowshipping, talking with each other. And then after seven, we'll have a little uh, Bible class and prayers, okay? The nursery will be provided from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. All right. Is that it? We have one more? That's it? Okay. I thank everybody for your attention. And also, we I would like to bring up something that if you are... Available like Saturday mornings, we have outreach ministry here. Uh, we had three people yesterday. We had a great time. We have lots of time. So if you have some time off on Sunday mo uh, Saturday mornings, around 10, 10, 30 in the morning, we gather here, and then we go out to the community to, sp to spread the seeds to bring more people to Christ. Okay. Now I'm going to leave you with Pastor Ben here for the feast of oh. Sunday morning. Thank you. Do we not do we not have that video for uh, <laughs> compassion? It's supposed to be one this morning. Uh, I'll take a moment and watch this video. This is this is from in promotion of next Sunday's Compassion Sunday. <clears throat> That'll be next Sunday. You'll have an opportunity to sponsor a child, and, and you can watch that child grow up, and you can, uh, just for a little bit of money a month, uh, it's either $36 or $38 a month, I forget, but uh, $38. We've been, you know, we've been sponsoring. I know some of you others have for many years, and it's, re it's a real joy to see that, that little bit of money will actually, what, how far it will go in one of those countries down there where, you know, it'll actually 
you know, feed and clothe and stuff for a little, little children. And it's very well supervised. And I'm talking about the money. You know, some of these, some of these things uh, aren't as much as others. But uh, they're, they're very well uh, supervised. They, they're very accountable. Well, we're in our second part of our series, Blessed Are, the Pathway to Happiness. So let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we ask that you would be our teacher today. God, I don't have anything to say that's going to benefit anybody. In fact, I pray you would guard and protect from anything that would come from just me. God, I pray that you would guide our hearts and be our teacher. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, See, Jesus starts out this most famous sermon in the history of the world, the most read, most analyzed talk in history in the world with these eight statements. And in these, you'd never think of people in these situations, the way he starts this out is that they would be a candidate for happiness. But that's what this is. Remember, uh, this is all about happiness. You know, people think when they find their true love, get rich, get famous, get their dream home, whatever it is, that then they'll be happy. And, you know, we've all, we all know plenty of stories, probably experienced ourselves, where we finally get that whatever it is, and, and we're still, after a little bit of time, we're still miserable and the same, same person we were because outward circumstances don't change anything. What changes us is an inner transformation with a relationship with the living God. And he's giving us these eight uh, lessons, these eight little short uh, uh, sentences that he's offering happiness in a way that the world would never expect it. You know, this doesn't look like anybody who would ever be happy in what he's saying, but with the living God, you know, Jesus is offering us happiness that can really happen in the real world. You know, it's why, you know, it's why people are sitting in prisons for their faith, and, they're, and they are extremely happy. It's why people are, you know, going through terrible, even in uh, terrible uh, heartbreaks of, of losing lost ones and loved ones and, and all sorts of things that people endure, but they're enduring them with Jesus Christ, and they can find happiness in the middle of all of that. And it's why people in lots of painful situations with their children can still believe that someday that prodigal will come home and, and people being mistreated in all kinds of ways can still find true happiness in this, in this world. But uh, it comes from, a, from uh, having the peace that Jesus came to bring. You know, and we're studying these statements that Jesus made in Matthew 5, 1 through 10, And remember last week what we talked about. Every time you see the word blessed, remember it means happiness. So every time you see that, let's read those statements together in Matthew 5, 1 through 10. It says, And seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In all of these statements, see, Jesus turns it upside down. You know, uh, it's, it, it doesn't look like there's any way anybody's going to be happy in any of those situations. But, but Jesus is telling people that, yes, you can. And he's talking to people who are hurting and lowly and downtrodden in the world that they were in. And they're, they've all come to him and they've, thousands of people have gathered to him because they've heard of this man who spoke like nobody else has ever spoken. He's one who had the words of life 
And so the, these people have gathered to him who are hurting and he's speaking to them with compassion. He's saying, I know you're going through all of this stuff. I know every one of you are hurting like this, but I can promise you there's happiness in the middle of it if you'll just trust me. Just trust me. And it, it does. It works. So, so the one we're focusing on today is Matthew 5, 4. He said, blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. You know, that just doesn't make any sense. But I want to talk to you about trading a season of sadness for eternal happiness. Eternal happiness, y'all, starts in the here and now. When you get eternal life, it starts right now. And that's the glorious thing about it. We're not waiting on something till we die. Eternal life in the kingdom of God, in the person of God, invades our world. And he comes right into our life, and he takes up residence in us and brings this about in us. If we'll just hang with him in it. You know, for, but the best that a person can hope for in this world, when they're going through one of these deep, dark situations... You know, all they're doing is hoping they can just get through it and get past it. And, you know, we would all be doing that for sure. But see, we can find him in the middle of it and find a peace that passes all understanding and a level of a relationship with him that you just can't know any other way. That's just the way it comes. Andre Crouch, uh, a great Christian singer from another generation, He's about the pioneer of modern gospel music, really. He says, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. That's not Vince Sanders up there. That's, that's Andre Crouch. <laughs> anyway, I shouldn't have said that. He's not even here. Y'all don't tell him I said that. Um, anyway, <laughs> back, back to Matthew 5. Four. Let's get back to the Bible. All right, he says... Blessed are those who mourn. I said, and how can you say that? That seems totally contradictory. It just seems like those two don't go together. But see, he's, Jesus is saying that it does. It does work. You know, and just, just a little disclaimer. Yes, God blesses us when we're in tough situations, for sure. And he, he wants us to go through a little seasons of that from time to time, but... God is all about laughter and joy and happiness. Jesus, to, Jesus told some pretty good jokes in there in, in Scripture, believe it or not. Uh, Proverbs 17.22 says, uh, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. See, God doesn't want us to go around you know, with a broken spirit in a deep state of depression. You know, that's not the goal. But he wants to use those times and to prepare us for things that are coming later. You know, the pathway to, let's think about going to the beach. You know, the, the, the pathway to happiness has to go through some, some, through some sad times sometimes. But, you know, you get the beach, it's all beautiful and, and it's, you're enjoying God's beautiful creation and, and it's just a time of like a little oasis. But you know, when you drive down to Florida, you got to go through some places like this down in Mississippi, you know, in, in Alabama. You know, there's some places like that that you don't want to hang around there too long. But you got to go through there to get to. That. And that's, that's what he's telling us today. And that's what he wants to get through us. Look, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 7, 3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter for a season. For by sadness of faith, faiths, the heart is made glass, glad. See, a season of sorrow is good for us. When God takes us through a sad time and he prepares us for a blessing that's coming later. Y'all, you can't see the blessing. You don't know what he's got in store. Don't stop right there and think the world has stopped. It hasn't. He can see the other side of that. We can't. So it's good for us. It's good for us sometimes because of what he's doing. 
And y'all, and he's always preparing us for eternity. That's always there. But you know, there are some people who refuse to mourn. They just will not do it. And they think that somehow life has, they're, they're entitled to be happy all the time. And they will not accept a season where God wants to teach them something. You know, and they, and they just refuse. And sometimes they turn to drugs and alcohol and sex or whatever to try to mask that pain or to try to escape it in some way. And because they refuse to that. Look at this situation in Luke 8, 52 and 53. See, Jesus shows up to bring good news even that in the middle of the loss of a precious loved one, he can bring hope in the darkest situations. But, but the, it says, the, you know, they laughed at him. They just refused. And see, by this time, y'all, his public ministry was so well known, he couldn't go anywhere without thousands of people showing up. And when they did, he almost always healed every one of them and, and taught them. And things and so and and you can see on the way to this story right here, he can't even get there hardly because of the crowds and everything around him and all the time. And by this time, see, they should have known that let's just stop and listen to him. Let's hear what he has to say before we start laughing at him. But see, they were so accustomed to this world and the way this world works that there's no answer beyond death. But Jesus was telling them, he said, he said, stop the weeping. She isn't even dead. She's only asleep. And of course, they laughed at him because they knew she had already died. See, Jesus was speaking symbolically and euphemistically and, and all of that. He was just telling them, hey, she's not really dead. You know, Jesus said about his followers, he said, we'll never die. And it says the crowd laughed at him. And not only laughed at him, this means to ridicule him over and over. I mean, they were really giving him a tough time over this. It doesn't all come out kind of. But back to Matthew 5, 4. See, they just, they just laughed him to scorn. They, wouldn't, they just wouldn't accept that, hey, here's a death. It's sad. You know, but let's listen to what Jesus has to say through it. And, and then back to Matthew 5, 4, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, yes, for they shall be comforted. Now, when it says they will be comforted, it uses a, a word for comfort. It's a special kind of comfort. This is a comfort that only God can promise. Nobody else can give this. It's actually the word that Jesus used to describe the coming of the Holy Spirit. See, when... when God invades our situation when God is there with us alongside of us when God has come into our world and he comes in with us when he says they'll be comforted he'll be the person who comes alongside of you the one who's going to keep encouraging you the one who's going to keep you going right in the middle of all of it and he's saying that he said he's going to be with there he's going to be with you so let's look at how God turns a season of sorrow into eternal happiness. And number one, it's different from the world's sorrow. See, the world's sorrow comes from a place of hopelessness. See, God hasn't promised to work everything for good for them. See, with us, He's promised everything that comes into our life, He's going to take it and work it and bring it together for good for us. They don't have that promise. That's only for the people who love God and are called according to His purpose. And He does that. <clears throat> but the best they can do is just hope things will get better. But let's look at the, you know, the outcome of sorrow. Now this, Paul is writing this letter in, in 2 Corinthians 7. And he's writing to this church in a, in a very immoral situation. And they, they don't even want to do anything about it. This church has so compromised itself and their witness with a, with a terrible immorality that's going on within them that, that it's, it's hurting a lot of people. And here's the deal. They weren't even sorry for their, their sin. You know, and so they're living with this. And Paul tells them, you know, in fact, 
Y'all even think you're cool for this. They think, you think you're cool because you accept the same kind of sin the world accepts. He says, you don't, you don't, even, you don't even get it. And so Paul had to, be really, he had to be really sharp with them. He had to be tough with them in this letter. And, and see, just, just quickly, a little time out there. Now, God and his family of people, he wants us to accept anybody who walks in these doors and anybody we run into outside of these doors and to love them and be patient with them no matter what they're going through and no matter what they've got going on in their life, y'all. He wants us to love them, but that's way different than being pleased with them and being pleased. Well, see, you can love somebody without being pleased with what they do. But see, they were actually proud of how tolerant they were and how there's no difference in them. You, know, you can, you know, we're cool too, you know. We, we will accept that too, you know. We're, we're, just, we're just like the people out in the world. So, see, the, so the Apostle Paul really had to get on their case about it. Let's just read it. He says in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, he says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that letter grieved you, though only for a little while. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief just produces death. Remember the difference, y'all. Now, I don't care what people are struggling with, you know, here in a, among us, God loves you. God is for you. I don't care what you're going through. But the difference, see, is struggling with it, trying to get it right. See, these people weren't struggling with it at all. They were proud of it and happy with it. Does it remind you of where we are in our world? But look, he says, even if I made you grieve with my letter, I don't, I don't regret it. See, because Paul could see the outcome of coming down on them. He didn't regret hurting their feelings just a little bit. He says, because he said it, he knew it was going to get a lot better for him. He said, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. See, a, a re, a, when a church gets anything close... When a, when a close when a church gets any my thing is messing up on me. When a church gets where they're they're just anything good with okay with everything you know. When a church starts tolerating everything, and I'm talking about tolerating the world and what the world celebrates and rejoices. When a, when the church gets like that, God is no longer around. God doesn't come and inhabit the praises of people who are living like that and who are celebrating that. And we've got churches here in the United States of America who were once strong, respected church and respected for their witness for Christ to live for Him and living different from the world. And now they've so compromised that they're ordaining even like practicing homosexuals and people who are practicing it and they're putting them in the pulpits and celebrating gay marriage and everything else. Y'all, God loves homosexuals now. But he does, that sin is an abomination to him. You know why? Because it hurts people. Look at uh, Jeremiah 6.15. He says, and Jeremiah is writing to the people when they're very corrupt. I mean, very corrupt. He says, and are they now ashamed of their disgusting actions? Let me just tell you how corrupt they were. They were about as corrupt as America is. That's how corrupt they were. That's, that's about what we've, we're, we're about where they were. He says, not at all. The, they, not at all. They don't even know how to blush. That's sobering. Therefore, they will lie down lie among the slaughtered, and they will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. See, they don't even know how to blush anymore. 
Y'all, can you remember a time when people used to blush talking about the things that are celebrated now? It wasn't very long ago. I mean, they're celebrating things. And, you know, and used to just a, a short time ago, people would blush talking about that. And now, now it doesn't even bother people. Don't even, don't even think about it. And so he says, they will be brought down when I punish them, said the Lord. So y'all, knowing that punishment is coming, is it being loving not to say anything? Is that loving and kind when we know judgment and punishment is coming? Is that loving people to not mention it? Is it loving not to say anything at all because we want them to like us? Do we want them to like us more than God likes us? Do we want them? I mean, is that, is that what we want? No, we don't. Not this church. We don't. But remember, y'all, we're commanded to speak the truth in love. Speak it, but speak the truth in love. Got to be careful with it. And we don't ever want to be judgmental and harsh and unloving toward people. But it's not loving not to say anything about that. It's not loving to just pretend everything is okay. It's not. Okay, back to 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. He says, but godly grief produces a repentance. See, it, it works something, he says. So you used to be okay with it, and now you see that the sin is against the God who loved you so much that y'all, if, if the sin was a good thing, God would want it for us. If whatever it is that, that people are, you know, if they want it so bad, but God doesn't, if it was good, God would want it. I mean, he gave his own son to die for us. Wouldn't he give us anything else? He said, so godly grief, see that, that time of sadness brings about, it leads to salvation without regret. See, something you'll never want to go back on is once you've ever tasted the glorious life in Jesus Christ, you never want to go back to that. See, you'll never regret that. Look at number two. So it's, it's something that is learned. See, God doesn't just hit you with a lightning bolt and then we just have this stuff. Most everything in the Christian life is something that we learn. You know, it's something that we go back over and over and time and time again. And we, we get a little bit of it now and then we get a little bit more later. And dealing with grief and sadness, it's the same way. You know, we learn how to walk through those times and we learn how to get better at it. And so uh, look at Philippians 4, 11. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Look, y'all, I'm, I'm thankful that this is not just something you, you're either born with it or you don't. You either have it or you don't. I'm glad it's something we can learn because if we didn't have it, then we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to learn it and get it. And look, see, Paul said, this is something I learned. You know, I learned how to be content with every situation. I learned that. You see, by this time, Paul has been at it a pretty good while, you know, 20 years or something like that. And so now he's learned how to deal with terrible situations. And he's even writing to a group of people. He spent some jail time there. You know, and God did an amazing thing there. But see, he's, he learned this. You know, and the word learn there is the word we get our learn word mathematics from. You know, we get uh, t two plus two, that's mathematics. You know, that's what you learn when, when you have your, you know, little kids with their chubby little fingers, you know, doing two and two like that and figuring out, figuring out like that. But, that. but that's mathematics. And see, two plus two will always equal four. It's four right now. It was four then. It'll be four tomorrow. And, all that. and that's the way the truth of God is, y'all. When you learn the truth of God and the truth of His Word, it's always true for us. Now, this next slide is, see, this is mathematics too. And that's, 
you know, Anne has a, uh, our son, uh, his, he's a PhD in mathematics, and he can live anywhere he wants to in the United States, and he just chooses where he wants to live, and they'll pay him and work, you know, but in, anyway, he, he would understand that. I don't even know what it is. I just got it from a college website, because <laughs> I thought it'd be a good idea, <laughs> but but that's a really complex mathematical equation. See, Paul probably knew it on that level, and then we learn it. We're probably somewhere between 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we're certainly not there. But, but the Apostle Paul was like that. You know, but you, you learn this. And the Word of God will get you through all kinds of life's sad moments. Because he's gonna, his truth is going to be with you always if you'll just stay in it and walk with him through it. Uh, listen to this quote from Rick Warren. It says, The Bible shows you the path to walk on. It shows you where you got off the path. It shows you how to get back on the path. And it shows you how to stay on the path. See, The, the, the Bible is everything you need if you'll just hang in there with it Hang in there with God, stay in that word, and you're going to learn how to deal with life's grief and everything else. Number three, Christ's comfort is more than enough. See, we'll discover that Jesus gives so much more comfort than whatever grief we're going through. Whatever, whatever it is we're going through, he'll get us through it. And look, look at Psalm 119.71. It says, for my suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. See, the psalmist is not saying, man, that, that felt good, you know, what he's going through. No, he's not saying that at all. He's saying that it was good for me. It helped me. It was good. It brought good out of the situation. It brought good in me. So it's truth that we learn to listen to God a whole lot better when we go through tough times. And so, you know, we think that when we're, you know, going through a terrible season or something that, you know, God is looking at us and saying, you know, is it you again? You know, you're, you're coming at me again. Didn't I help you with that last time? You know, see, God is not thinking like that of us. He, he understands that we learn gradually and all. And but every time you go through grief, just don't assume that God is punishing you. Y'all, God poured out the punishment on His Son. That's the biggest problem I run into with, with talking with Christians all the time. Is they, they always think that God's punishing them for something. Immediately, it's the first thing they think of. When something bad happens, they think it's because of something they did. Y'all, that's not the way God works. Now, He will if it takes it. But you'll get a lot of warnings from it before he ever does anything like that. He will only do that as a last resort. Look at Hebrews 4.15. He says, For this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he was faced all, all of the same testings we do, yet he did with not sin. In the middle of it. See, he's been through all of it. No one mourned more in this life than Jesus. The Bible calls him a man of sorrows. He, he was in this world and he saw the hurt and the wounds and everything that people were going through. That's why he came to do something about it. And he understands it. And he wept from time to time over things that he knew he was going to fix. It, it still it brought sadness to him and all. But... Uh, see, he, he understands what we're going through. So look at uh, 2 Corinthians 1.5. He says, uh, uh, how the, how the, it's how the, the Word of God just keeps on you know, getting us through these things. He says, for just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, thus through Christ our comfort overflows also. So uh, he's saying there's a, when, when God's given you 10 gallons of suffering to go through, and when he allows that hurt to come into your life, he's going to give you more than 10 gallons of the comfort of God. 
It's, it's written that if you got this much sadness, you got this much grief, God's going to give you this much more yeah. comfort in Christ. And it, but, it, but it's available to Him, I mean through Him, to us. You know, sometimes, y'all, it just hurts to follow Jesus. Jesus said it was going to be like that. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. In other words, you're going to have distressful times. It's coming. And, any of, and that, that brand of Christianity that everything's going to be gloriously wonderful all the time, that's not biblical Christianity. That's heaven when you die. Heaven came to invade this world, and He's going to take you out of it later. But you shouldn't be in too big a hurry to leave this one. Because, <laughs> anyway. But y'all, he's there for us. And he's going to be everything we need. And he's going to be more than what we need. For the people who turn to him. So I'm, I'm inviting you today, you know, to just turn to him right now. Whatever, whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is, just let's just bow our heads. And turn to him right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you, dear God. Thank you for your kindness. And Lord, thank you that you are enough. And thank you that your truth is enough. And Lord, thank you that your standards stay the same. That if something is harmful for, for us, you tell us. And you tell us because you love us. Dear great God, thank you, Father, for, for being there. And thank you that you're always going to be there. Father, I pray if there's anybody here today who has never really committed themselves to you or anybody who wants to recommit themselves to you, to rededicate their life. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have right now. Father, we pray that there's somebody listening or somebody will listen that will just turn to you and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I ask you to come into my life and save me. And he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.